Hello, everyone, and welcome to our workshop on getting started with Cisco Catalyst SD-WAN APIs. So this is a workshop that's following the webinar we had earlier this week. On Tuesday, we were, we were going over you know, a PowerPoint showing you what a, uh, an API is, what REST, what the REST framework is, uh, some of the REST tools. And then we had a look at the components of Cisco Catalyst SD-WAN, the manager, the controllers, the validator, uh, their role. And then uh, we were saying that the uh, Cisco Catalyst SD-WAN manager also has a REST API interface. I showed you a bit the API docs, the uh, self-documented Swagger interface that comes with it, with all the endpoints that are available with the, with the manager server. And today during our workshop, um, we're gonna go and actually dive in hands-on. I'll show you the uh, documentation for the API. I'll show you the developer tools. I'll show you the sandboxes that we have. And then I'll also show you Postman and how to use Postman to kind of build your own uh, API calls and how to get data from a REST API interface. So all of that today, it's a packed session. But first, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Adrian Iliasiu. I'm a developer advocate with Cisco Developer Relations, where I cover enterprise networking products such as Cisco Catalyst SD-WAN, Cisco Meraki, Cisco DNA Center, and then Cisco iOS XE. So if you have any questions, developer related about any of these products, I'm your person, feel free to contact me. Uh, I'm on Twitter at AI DevNet. I'm on LinkedIn. If you search my name, you can find me there. Uh, drop me a message, more than happy to help in, in any way that I can. All of you to get started, or if you're already started and you had more advanced questions about something not working, an API that's not there, for any of these products, let me know. I can either get it fixed for you or I can go and, um, and get somebody that will. All right, so um, having said that, let's get started. So first of all, I wanted to show you the developer.cisco.com slash sd1. This is what we call our dev center for, uh, for sd1. And here you can find links to pretty much all the resources we have available for you from a developer perspective. So we have the documentation link we'll see in a bit. We have link to sandboxes, and we also have a series of videos that I've done on how to get started with uh, programming an SD-WAN fabric, uh, how to attach templates, how to get a list of devices uh, with the API. And all of that can be found in the uh, also in the videos over there. And uh, they're on YouTube. You can view them. They've been there for a while. Um, they might need an update. We'll see how, how that goes. All right. So if you scroll down here, right, you have a link to the learning labs, intro to uh, SD1 REST APIs, how to get started with Postman. So pretty much everything I'm going to show you today you can watch the recording of this and follow it along after or if you want to follow uh today as we go through all this content you're more than welcome to the point is also if you have any questions while we do this live you can drop them in the q a panel uh and i'll address them as we uh, advance through this workshop so please take advantage of this uh all you only need internet connection a web browser and uh, Postman. So if you haven't installed Postman yet, go to uh, getpostman.com, make sure you install it. You have a version running uh, on your own local machine if you want to follow along the workshop today. So you have links to learning labs, you have links to documents, the Postman collection, and we're gonna talk about a bit later today, uh, links over here, and then there's also videos, as well as sandbox links here at the bottom, sample code, pointing you to our code exchange where you can find uh, code samples of several code samples of uh, you know folks that have been automating their SD1 fabrics and they wanted to share with the community. So these are mostly GitHub hosted repos of sample code that folks have developed over the years. And we also have a list of SD1 partners if you want to see in our ecosystem exchange uh, what our partners uh, have been working on around SD-WAN 
fabrics. Um, all right, so let's jump and go into uh, the docs page. So the docs is going to be one of the most important uh, websites here for you as you start exploring programming with uh, with the SD WAN um, fabric because it gives you a link of uh, to all the API endpoints and explanation. You also have a quick introduction here how the fabric looks what the components are we've seen this also on tuesday um and then you know how to authenticate what is the endpoint for you to authenticate you see here vmanage ip address and then g security check we'll see this in postman also then the content type right this will be a header that specifies what type of information you are sending for authentication purposes and then you have the http body which is basically just the J username and J password would be the credentials that you log in to that um, manager instance. So you get a, a um, session ID. If the authentication was successful, you get a session ID that after that you can use uh, in all your subsequent calls uh, as you make them and interact with the, with the manager. So you have kind of like this cookie based session ID that you can use for performing subsequent API calls. Also, we'll see, we'll create our own uh, new header. We'll call it XXSRF token. So this is a uh, an extra security that has been added after version 19.2 right of the um, manager so you also need a token as part of your interaction with the api so i'll show you how to actually add one more header in postman and how to actually save that token uh, and reuse it in your calls so that's, you know, how to authenticate. There's a, a class authentication here, a uh, Python code snippet for you. If you want to get this and start using it right away, you can. So this is authentication. Uh, we have here how to authenticate in SSO enabled uh, manager. Uh, so we'll have a look, like I said, at this XSRF token. Then you have a quick start right uh explaining you the base uri basically the vmanage server and then slash data service would be your starting point for for everything api related uh with cisco sd WAN manager and you hear, you see here that the api organized in six main categories you have administrative and management apis so this is where you would uh, create users, groups, you know, you would manage your tenants, software maintenance, backup and restore, container management would be performed with these API calls. Then you have alarm and events APIs, which includes alarms, event notifications, rather than configuration. So this is where you would perform configuration tasks with the APIs in this grouping. So includes features, feature templates, device templates, how to create them, how to apply them, how to update them. You'll create device policies, device certificate, certificate management, uh, device actions, device inventory, so on and so forth. Pretty much everything configuration related uh, and all the API endpoints that come with that would be under this grouping. Then you also have device real-time monitoring so this would be real-time monitoring of devices, links, applications, systems, everything real-time monitoring would be in this grouping. Device states, statistics, bulk APIs. So this includes device states, aggregated statistics, and bulk queries. You can perform uh, uh, multiple queries at a time. And then troubleshooting and utility as a last grouping. So um, the API follows the... Um, Swagger 3.0 uh, spec definition. So we'll see here as you go into the API reference, you see the API endpoints and also very important the change logs. Right. So we have the latest version is 20.11. Then 
that we have. You have also for historical purposes, older versions available here for you. So you have 20.10, 20 20.9, 20 6, and then 20.4. Um, so if you go and you click on the change log, you would see what endpoints have been added, removed, what endpoints have been deprecated as part of this release. So very important to keep track of you know, what has changed from one version to the next. So that if you've, if you've developed um, your application on your code on let's say 20.10 and you want to upgrade to 20.11, you would want to check the change log and make sure that you know the endpoints that you are using are still there or if they've been uh, modified in any way, then you are aware of those modifications. So you see here, these are the endpoints that have been added in this version. Lots and lots of endpoints. There's some that have been removed, right? Some multi-cloud, and then there is some endpoints that have been deprecated and then also changed. So um, very important information here for you to keep track of. And then to see the actual, all the endpoints that are available with the version 20.11, in this example, we'll just click on it and you'll see here we have all the endpoints. So as we were saying, the slash data service would be your starting point, kind of at the top of the um, of that hierarchical structure for the API. And then we have all the API endpoints following that data service slash would be access token. And then these are parameters that you need to pass in, right? So region-based URI and client ID. As you see these curly braces, these are parameters that you need to pass in uh, into your API call. So we have monitoring, we have administration. You see here some of these um, APIs have been uh, retired or deprecated. Right, so they're they're pretty much gone, but we have new ones. So if you want to get the admin users, right, would be uh, data service slash admin slash user. If you click on all any of these calls, you actually are able to see. So it's get all users. It doesn't require any parameters, and you have the option of seeing here. Right, uh, this call is, is very simple. There is just a get call uh, to get a list of all the users. But then if you want to create a new user, you would use this post call. This would basically create a user. Uh, there's no parameters that you need to pass in, but there is a body that you need to pass in, right? With what type of username uh, and password uh, you want to create. So the body, would look like this. So uh, what type of, in what group you want to place that user, a description, a username, a password, a locale, and then also the group name specified like so. So you can see also a schema for this. And then you get responses 200, right, would be a success or 201 user created, 400 by request, forbidden, and 500 would be as we were talking on Wednesday, uh, on Tuesday, sorry, would be those uh, server side errors in the 500. So you know the uh, there's something wrong with your manager server. So that's how you create a user, right? You would um, do a post call to data service slash admin slash user with this body. You would send it, and that user with that credential would be created for you. All right, so. Uh, I was saying these are administrative endpoints, right? Getting users, creating users. But then we also have monitoring, real-time monitoring. So you can get a list of all the alarms. You can create new alarms um, at this stage. Um, and you would also have, as I was saying, configuration-based uh, API endpoints. So schedule, backup, restore here, all the endpoints on how to accomplish that. Then you would have cloud service, endpoints for that, certificate management. So get a certificate details, um, certificate service request, the CSR. 
get the details for the CSRs that are uh, part of your manager. Um, invalidate certificates also, you can do through the API, of course. If a certificate has been compromised, you will want to invalidate them as soon as possible. Uh, cloud service here, and then configuration, Cloud Express, cluster management, right, API endpoints. So lots and lots of uh, API endpoints, pretty much everything or most of the tasks that you can do in the um, graphical user interface for your manager server, you can also perform those through an API call. And I'll show you the developer tools. That's what actually happens whenever you click on something in the graphical user interface for your manager server actually API calls get triggered and hit the backend of your manager server and all that information gets displayed to you in the web uh, interface. But in the backend, it's all API calls and are all these API calls that I'm showing you here that are being performed in the background. So then you can, of course, start automating, right? If for whatever reason, uh, you don't like the graphical user interface of, uh, of the Cisco Catalyst, as the one manager, right? Then you can build your own. We have provided you the API endpoints. All of them are there uh, accessible to you so you can build your own interfaces. Um, I've had a use case that I've built actually a monitoring front end. Uh, we had one of our customers, our partners in Latin America that came to us and we actually helped them build a front end um, a JavaScript front end developed in React that basically connects to several different vManage instances in the background, extracts information from them and displays them um, to the user, all done through API calls, right? So we're interacting with the, all this vManage instance or the manager instances um, using those API calls. And you'll see me move between manager uh, and vManage, I'm still uh, kind of moving towards the manager nomenclature. Uh, so I'm sorry if I if I uh, if I say vManage from time to time, but I'm still also in the transition of getting adjusted to the new naming convention. So see your collocation, service group, lots and lots of endpoints. Some of them have been removed. Uh, system container monitoring device details. So you can get a list of uh, status of the devices. I right? get device would get you a list of all devices. Uh, you have a, an optional parameter here, site ID, if you want to extract information of all devices from uh, only one specific site, then you would specify it as part of your API call with this optional parameter. So you see how it would look the output, what type of information you'll get would be uh, after data. So you get a device ID, right? System IP, uh, host name, if it's reachable or not, status, uh, what role it has, it's manager, um, controller, validator, the time zone, when it was last updated. So lots and lots of great version of code. Lots of great information that's being made available to you with one API call. You get a list of all your devices in the fabric. Very, very useful as you start automating and building your own um, programmable interfaces into these fabrics. All right, so then we have more monitoring, right? Data collection agent, uh, real time monitoring, AAA configuration, device actions, device firmware update for configuration, software actions, device software upgrades, right? So you see lots and lots of real-time monitoring. Uh, I'm not gonna cover them all. There's really thousands of API endpoints uh, for you to go explore, uh, discover, get familiar with, and this would be where you would go to kind of get started, read up on what API endpoints are available. You would start with the documentation for that API. 
Also in here, we have our developer resources. So links to sandboxes in here, uh, to learning labs. So we have SD1-based learning labs. Uh, we have an SDK that we call Sastre, right? So you can use this Python SDK to uh, interact via Python. We build this SDK for you to make it easier for you to interact with, uh, with the API. You don't need to build necessarily every single API call manually, adding headers, um, extracting the data, making sure that it's a, a Python object. You would have to use a JSON library to make sure that it's, as you get the data back, it's in a, in a Python object. Right, so used to use that, that's already taken care for you once you start using the, the SDK. So a link here to the SDK. Then we have sample code going over to the code exchange. So you see here we have 92 repos as of today with um, in regards to SD1 sample code. So you have uh, SD1 Ansible code. There's um, a configuration here done with Ansible. If you would like to use that, there's then the SAS tree right here, SDK that I was mentioning about. There's SD1 DevOps, uh, Postman, Cloud Native Operator, right? so Cloud SD1, uh, Terraform. If you're a Terraform, even Puppet, if folks are still using Puppet, right? So lots and lots of repos, sample codes that uh, we have contributed as Cisco, but also the community has contributed here. Uh, and we have gathered them all in one location for you. So we have the sample code automation use cases, then Cloud Native SD-WAN documentation. If you want to have a look at Cloud Native SD-WAN and the Cloud Native SD-WAN project, um, it's all documented in here, how it works, wh what it actually is, what's the architecture, and then also um, how to install it and, uh, and all of that. You also have links to Thousand Eyes documentation and then community and support. This is where you would reach out to us for support if you have any questions, support related. Um, we have a community set up on communities.cisco.com for SD-WAN. So if you have any questions that you just start working and start automating and start programming your uh, SD-WAN fabrics, if any questions come up or you're running into any problems, you can always contact us on communities.cisco.com under the SD-WAN tag, drop a message in there and uh, somebody will answer to you guaranteed. We're monitoring those communities and we're responding and replying to the queries as they come in. All right, so that's the documentation part, right? Critically important for you to have a look at this, go through it, read. Um, and then next, what I would like to show you is the sandboxes, actually. Let's see if we have a link to the sandboxes going. Uh, there we go. So the sandboxes, we have two sandboxes um, for SD1, a uh, always on sandbox. Uh, and then a reservable sandbox. They're both running version 20.10. They've been recently uh, updated to 20.10. And um, if you don't have your own SD-WAN fabric, right, these sandboxes give you the option of using them for free. They're available online pretty much all the time. We'll see actually if, uh, if they work. Hopefully they do. I have also reserved sandbox. And then we'll also have a look at the always on one. So once you click on try it out, right, you get forwarded to our DevNet sandbox. And this is a fairly simple SD1 fabric, right? You have your um, manager, validator, controller, and then there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, devices as part of this fabric, right? With different sites hanging off of each of these um, CH devices. 
And um, to access it, you will go to this link and you will use these credentials, right? So let's see if we can log in with DevNet user. Continue, password. And there we go. Uh, I'm not going to change it. There we go. This is our always on SD1 sandbox, right? Uh, you'll see here there's four managed edge devices, they're reachable. Um, side one, side two, side three, and then uh, data center, their catalyst 8000 Vs, right? It looks like they're, uh, there's some health issues for them as they come online. But this would be an always on sandbox, right? With uh, a fabric running for you and being accessible over the internet, um, running version 20.10, like I was saying, right? So you have the options of seeing uh, the configuration. You cannot really perform any changes. This is a read only sandbox because it's always on. We don't want people to break it and even, uh, making it only uh, read only, we still get some issues sometimes with uh, the sandbox being just overrun by users. So you have to be careful. Um, if it's not responding, we have a bot that also resets this sandbox every so often, and it will become available for you uh, shortly if it's, it's not accessible. So read only, right? You have the option of interacting with a uh, manager for an SDN fabric. You have the administration here. We have the workflows, monitoring. You can see an overview. Uh, you can see the devices, applications. And what I also wanted to show you is the API docs that I was mentioning. So if we go and we copy this, we'll make a new tab. And I go to API docs. This should give us, there we go, uh, pretty much all the API endpoints, right? Well, like how we've seen the documentation, they're also available here. So if I go, and the nice thing here is that if I access the API docs on the manager instance itself, I can actually go and interact with, uh, with these endpoints. So I can, uh, configuration, whereas devices, I can get a list of the devices. I should be able to device template, device inventory. So I'm going to do a uh, get bootstrap post system IP. Let's see where we have an endpoint. Then we can actually try VH status. Let's see if we can try this, right? So you see the option here. We have try it out. Uh, so this is actually going to go and execute this API call on this vManage instance, right? So here we have the response body, and you see the status of the uh, V edges. We have total controllers three. Uh, controllers out of sync zero, and there's no tenants, right? So you get quick status of, let me make it a bit bigger here so that you folks can see, right? Total controllers three, controllers out of sync zero, right? So you have the request URL automatically here for you. So it's slash data service, slash system, slash device, slash controller, slash VS, slash status, return a status of your, all your VH devices. You have also the curl call here, right? Uh, and you would have, uh, it's a get call. This is the URL that you're accessing. Same thing as here. And then the headers, right? You would have an accept application JSON. Then you would have this custom header X XSRF token, which contains the token, authentication token. And that's how you're able to perform the API call. So you can test it right under the uh, slash API docs, right? And get a list of 
uh, your devices. Let's see what else we have. Um, device inventory, circuit, uh, device actions, you can uh, cancel, change partition, activate, deactivate devices as uh, it goes through. Let me see, are there any questions? Uh, let me just quickly see. We'll be... Yes, so the session will be also on YouTube, right? We're recording this, we'll be on Bright Talk as well as YouTube. So if you have any questions, make sure you also drop them if you watch this recording you know, later. Drop the questions on our YouTube channel and we'll monitor them and answer your questions over there. Uh, any questions coming through? Yes, Chima, we're recording it. Yes, so the session is recorded, like I was saying. All right, so this is slash API docs, right? Accessible on the manager server itself. Like I said, you can interact and do these API calls live. You can try them out. You've seen how I got a list of the VH status devices. Um, and that's how you would basically interact with your API. That's one way that you could interact uh, at this slash API docs. All right, next thing that I wanted to show you all, and we were talking about also on Tuesday, is the developer tools. Right, so if I open in my browser, uh, here I have Chrome, it would be under View Developer, Developer Tools. So this opens this new window here. Uh, in Chrome is on the right hand side, in Firefox is at the bottom. It's not really important. It's the same information displayed uh, for all of them. But as you interact with objects right here in the GUI, so for example, I got a list of devices, you see here the API calls that are actually performed in the background to actually extract and display that information for you. So we should have here a summary count. Oh, devices right here. So this would be the endpoint data service slash health slash devices. And we're passing in, like I was saying on Tuesday, also with the question mark, right? We see page size of 12,000. So that would be return only the first 12,000 devices. We only have a handful here, but that's how you would filter your output. And then in the response, you actually see the exact same information that we have here on the left-hand side, right? You'll see it right here. So we have our first total devices. We have 43. If I scroll down, we see here 43, right? So it's the exact same devices that you see here. The VH Cloud would be UUID with this UID, right? It's a VH Cloud device. Um, serial number, VPN ID, so on and so forth, right? So as you interact with the graphical user interface, you see here automatically shows all the API endpoints, and then you're able to you know, go and see the CPU response, uh, right? Good for the health, this would be what headers are involved. So it's, you see the request URL, you see that it's a get, you see the status code, we see the remote address, right? And then the headers, response headers here with content encoding, content type, we see application JSON, the date of today. Uh, and then also the request headers. So response headers, request headers. You have here the method, the path, for you right here, the accept application JSON, right? So that would tell 
the manager here yeah, i'm sending you json data or i'm uh, i'm expecting also with um with the accept header you actually tell it hey, i'm uh, accepting json format the data so please send the response in json format you see the cookie right so this is the j session id we'll have a look at it uh, in postman also and then you see also the xsrf token right here at the bottom and you see events right as it gets updated and refreshed you see the response uh, for all these API calls that are happening in the background. Uh, all right, let's see. Any questions? Using is it free to build a lab? Yes. So the everything on developer.cisco.com is free, right? The sandboxes, documentation, the learning labs, the code samples everything is available to you for free all you need is in a is a free account you log in and you have access to uh to all of these resources so good question hussein and then albert how did you get the aps section of the manager so albert going back right you just have the um the host name or the ip address of your uh manager in this case, it's sandbox-sd1-2.cisco.com. And then you would go slash API docs, right? So if I do that, it opens up uh, a list of all the API endpoints. And here is nice that I can actually interact with them and try them out, right? So hope that answers the question. What else we have? Uh, any other questions, comments? Uh, you see, yes. All right. So we've answered the questions. Um, I showed you the developer tools, right? So this is how it looks as you perform tunnels. You want to see the tunnels. You will actually uh, see here. Monitor as you tunnels. It would be this, the response. Uh, and these are how many we have in here. We have 48. And we'll see here all 48 tunnels, right? This is how they're actually returned. And the GUI, the graphical user interface from here is just displaying them to you in a web interface format. But the data, how it looks in the back, uh, in the back end, in the background is exactly here. Right, very useful as you start exploring. Um, and as you perform you know, your usual workflow in the graphical user interface, you click on configuration, you go there. So you can keep a track and save all these calls, right? And then go and build your code and start automating. So I'm following a specific number of steps to perform my workflow, right? Configuration of your device template and I'm applying it here. So all the steps you go through in the GUI, you can record them. You can see all the API endpoints that you are hitting with each of those calls, or each of those clicks, right? Each of those refresh pages, you can record them and then you can automate them, right? And there's several different ways that you can automate them. There's, you know, you can build a Python script to, to automate and to perform all those calls for you automatically, or you can use something like Postman that we're gonna look, have a look at, uh, at next. The browser, okay, uh, please consider either reducing your resolution or increasing the browser zoom. Yes, Michael, uh, let me see if I make it even larger. Right. I have a uh, wide screen over here. So you should be able to see this better now. Let me make it bigger. Right, so you, hopefully you, you're able to see better now all the um, the tunnels that have been established as i was saying are in in there very useful developer tools uh, as you start working with apis right uh, it's very useful to start and explore what's happening in the background right for all these 
graphical uh, user interfaces, what actually data they extract and how they display it for you. All right, I see another comment from John. If you're preparing for a migration between Vim managers, which tool is more suitable for backup and restore configuration and change data to accommodate templates from old to new operation parameters like Vbone information inside of each template? So migration, which tool is more suitable for backup? Well, I mean, you have the built-in backup option, right? You can do, uh, what was it? Uh, administration, uh, manage user settings, disaster, VPN groups, tools, rediscover, tag, template, tag management. Hmm, what was it? Uh, is this because I'm a read-only user? Configuration, network design, policies. So you could get a complete backup, John, right, of all the options as pretty much a JSON output. Uh, but I'm pretty sure, let me open the always on. Uh, sorry, the reservable sandbox, 10, 10, 20, 90. Let's see if it works. So this is this one has uh, issues. I can log into it. But basically, you have the option of um, backing up your configuration, right? all your configuration of the vManage and just import it in your new manage instance. Um, or you can just do an upgrade, an in-place upgrade for your vManage or your manager server, and then you don't need to back up anything. You just, you could back up the manager VM itself, right? Take a snapshot of it before the upgrade. You upgrade, bring it to the new version, 20.11, whatever version you're upgrading to. And then, you know, you don't need to back up your config. You already have a snapshot of your manager. In case something happens, you can just quickly revert back. Um, and also, you could export all your configuration using the APIs, right? So uh, all your device templates, you could use a get call, all your configuration templates, policies, device policies, you can export them as JSON and then just add them back in your new um, manager instance. Okay, so William, I have a massive SDN family in my company and we use to get the routing tables as a pre-check every change we should perform on the environment. Sadly, it was a lot of time to get the full routing table. Can I use API to get or extract this information in an easy, fast way? Yes, you can get a list of all your routes. Let me quickly search here, uh, route, policy app, Policy VH route definition builder, application aware route, uh, definition get template plus definition VH route. So, yes, William, you can get your routing table over the APIs. You would just figure out which API endpoint does that for you. And the data, oh, this is empty. I don't have anything configured here for this. But like I said, you would go into the graphical user interface, right? Where is the routing table displayed for you, right? Whatever there is in the configuration, uh, right? You select network design and you see here on the left-hand side, um, the API call that that is pertaining to the IP route, the show IP route. Uh, command, you would see it in uh, developer tools, and then you can use that API call to, you know, perform that call whenever you want uh, with a tool like Postman we'll go into next. All right, great conversation. Thanks for all the questions. Um, so now let's go. I showed you developer tools. Um, curl also is included here. Right, automatically, if you prefer to use curl, that's how you use it. As part of the tools, I showed you developer tools. Let's go and talk about Postman. 
So with Postman, if you're not familiar with it, Postman is one of the REST API testing clients tools out there. Uh, there are many. Postman is one of them. We, I mean, I'm a fan of Postman because it's very simple. It's very easy to use. And we also have what we call collections, environments that we have developed for Postman over the years. So you can find them if you actually search. Let me see where I have it here. So if you go and search for Postman Cisco Workspace, right on Google, Bing, whatever your, your, your favorite search engine is, the first link that pops up is the Cisco DevNet public workspace, right? So if I click on this, let me make it larger, zoom in. So these are what we call Postman collections and environments that you can actually download and use uh, and expand and modify as you see fit, right? So we have quite a bit of collections for crosswork, for App Dynamics, for CloudLock DNA Center, right? So we have here several uh, how you authenticate, basically, right? Then how you get a list of network devices, uh, tags, pad trace, right? But Interside iOS XC. But for our discussion today, we have our Cisco SD WAN, right? Collection here and Cisco SD-WAN always on. So these are basically two collections that we're gonna explore. Uh, you would have to sign in. So let me quickly sign, oh, I can't do that. Uh, one second. Uh, so you would have to sign in, create an account. It's a free account again, also for Postman. You just need a, an email address. And you can, after that, create a fork, right? So you create a fork, that means that it creates a copy in your own environment. And I have a fork created for Cisco SD-WAN right here, right? So uh, I see it's Ace fork, I'm logged in. Uh, I'm logged in into my Postman account. I created a fork for that Cisco SD-WAN workspace and also for the environment. So a collection in Postman is just a grouping of several different API calls, right? So you see here, I have a call for authentication. I have one for getting the token. And then I have get calls for uh, getting a list of the fabric devices, device status, device templates, device policy, so on and so forth. These are all get calls here. Uh, you can create your own, right? And actually we will create our own next. So this is the collection, right? With several different API calls already created for you, predefined. And then we have what we call an environment. So if I click on this the environment, it opens up uh, my environment. And this is basically a way of passing in variables into your calls, into your collections, right? So I see here, I have uh, five variables. I have a vManage variable with this value. So this is the... Um, manager server that I'm connecting to. J username would be uh, the, this is the username, the J password is the password, and then the port, and then I have access token, right? So I have five variables and how I'm actually able to use them using the double curly braces, right? As part of your call, you see here, uh, this will automatically get propagated with uh, the values that you've defined in your environment. So you can also see them here for a quick view. You can edit them. So if I want to change and point into a different vManage instance with different credentials, then I would just edit these entries, right? I would change it to a different instance of manager with, with uh, the credentials that come with that. And I'm able to perform 
all my API calls in the collection automatically because I don't need to replace them in every single call. I have variables defined and they will get automatically replaced with what I've defined in my environment. So you see here, if I just uh, hover over these variables, you see is uh, the value, the port, and then the username and password here, right? So it is, we see it's a post call. You can get, get post. These are the methods that we were talking about on Tuesday. So we have a post call because we are creating um, a new token, right? And the session ID on the vManage server, passing these credentials, we go and we actually create a new session ID and then a new token uh, for our session. So it's a post call. Uh, the endpoint for authenticating is slash J underscore security underscore check. So how would you know this documentation? As I've showed you earlier, this endpoint was specific, uh, was specified over there. Okay, so I have, this is the URL, right? It's a post call. I have the method here. Then I have parameters here, the option of specifying any parameters with the question mark, right? That we're telling you about if you want a page size, if you want to filter output, so you would specify the parameters here. Then authorization, um, if what type of authorization it is, right? It's a no auth, API key, buried token, basic auth, OAuth, one, two, AWS signature, so on and so forth. Several different uh, authorization and authentication methods are supported out of the box with Postman. Then you have the headers, right? What type of headers we have here? So it's just content type. Make sure that you have application slash X W form uh, URL encoded. Um, and also content type here, or oh, I have it twice, that's fine. And then the body would be that J underscore username and J underscore password, right? That's how we pass in the username and password uh for our manager server so now uh, i'm kind of ready to press send here oh if you start using these sandboxes important to remember in the settings of postman make sure ssl certificate verification is turned off because we have self-signed certificates on them unless the certificate you have running on your manager instance is an authentic certificate then of course if it's a production environment you should definitely have that then you would have this sss certificate verification on but if it's just a lab environment you can switch it off um, and not check the authenticity of your ssl certificate for that manager instance so that's something to keep in mind if you want to follow along exactly what i'm doing here Uh, all right, so then I'm ready to do a, to click on send. This will send the request. Uh, there we go. We had a 200 status okay, right? So the output is empty, but a cookie has been saved. So I can actually look at the cookies. And I see here I have a J session ID, right? Uh, that has been created. The nice thing with Postman is that it saves that J session ID cookie. And if I go and I perform the next call, which is the get token call, uh, would be the J session ID is automatically saved, right? I can see it here under cookies, right? You can uh, remove it at any point and do again an uh, authentication or just reuse the one that you have already created previously. So to get that um, XSRF token, right? You need to go under the same vManage port data service. And then you have slash client slash token, right? So let's get that token. And we see here in the body, this is the token that is, that comes with this J session ID session. So now another thing that we're performing here is that we have on the tests, you can write simple JavaScript or complicated JavaScript code that would actually, in this case, will take this text, will take the, uh, the token, and actually will set the access token 
environment parameter. So if I go and I look here, this access token, I see it has been automatically updated with A5BA02, all right? The whole access token has been updated. So the very nice thing with, with Postman, like I said, is right here in the test. That's another option for you. If you want to save a value from one of these calls and reuse it, and we, we will reuse it as part of our site health, right? We have here a new header called x-accessrf-token. And we see here we're passing that access token that we get in the previous call, right? Very nifty, very nice of passing variables between all these calls. So if I go and I do a send on this call, it is, we see here a get call. We're going for the vManage instance, same one slash data service, statistics, site held common, and then interval 30 minutes. You're able to see here the output uh, so site ID, site health is fair, device health is fair, right? Device health score is a 5.0, tunnels health score. So you see all your sites, we have one, two, four sites in here uh, with you know, fair to good status site health for, uh, for them. Also, I can do interface statistics. So same thing, right? We have that X XRSRF token, access token passed in. Um, it is a get call. We're going for the same vManage server, same port, but the endpoint is different now. It's statistics slash interface. And this will basically go and get statistics for all the interfaces in the fabric. Careful when you do this call in a large environment, because even in a small environment with four devices, uh, you see it's going to take quite a bit of time. We have okay, six, six seconds. So you're able to go and check your interface statistics. Uh, so this is the device, VH Cloud. You have packets per second, transmit, total megabits per second, um, kilobits per second received, right? So Arox uh, would be kilobits per second received, as we see here is two on this interface. Uh, transmit octets, 1260, operational status, if it's up or down, if there's any errors, right? So you can check very easily, get do an API call, extract this information, parse it, and you can have a look at um, Arax errors. Okay, so I see a question here, Mike. Where do I set the variables again for the calls? So the variables, Mike, are in the environment. All right, so you see here, you, there's a drop down. I have them under environments. I have created a new one. Well, I have once I made the fork of that uh, Cisco sd one collection and environment, right? I made a fork of it. It got cloned locally on my machine so that I can modify it. So you have your environment, you have your variables defined here, right? You have your vManage and we have this access token that's gonna get dynamically populated, right? Right here. So if I uh, delete this one, I can easily create one, uh, a new authentication and that's gonna create a new access token. And this is gonna be dynamically populated because we're using this piece of JavaScript code, right? To get, basically we're getting the response, the text of the response, which is this. We'll, we're saving it in this response variable. And then we're setting the environment for access token so the environment variable called access token will get the value from the response, right? Two lines of code, very powerful of saving that token, uh, having it in our environment and being able to reuse it in all our calls without you know, having to manually modify all the calls in our collection every single time.
Perfect. So that's how you set variables. Um, then we have, of course, fabric devices, right? Data service, that's device. Um, and we can actually also create a new call from scratch. So this is how it looks, right? What type of call it is first, we'll do a get call. And then we'll do HTTPS, double curly brace, we'll specify vManage. That will get populated with the vManage, with the manager instance we have as part of our environment. Then we have the port, right? If it's a special port, it's not 443. And then we have data service will be the entry point. And then um, we can check, let's go back and check what API endpoint should be, not in Firefox, but in here. We were looking at configuration, that VH status device, let's get that one. So we'll get device inventory. And we did a get, here we go. System device controllers VH status, right? So let's do this exact same call, but in Postman, I'm just gonna move it a bit aside here. So it's data service system slash device slash controllers slash V edge slash status. All right, so that's our call. Uh, we see it's a get call and you get the V edge status. Let's see if we're getting anything, any luck now. If I do a send, we have a 200 okay. And we see the total controllers is three controllers out of sync, zero and 10 on the list, nothing, right? So it should be pretty much uh, what we get here if you try it out. So try it out, execute, exact same information, right? Total controllers three out of sync, uh, zero, and there's no tenants defined. Um, all right, so that's where variables, that's how it works. That's how you create your own API call, right? So then I can save this. It's an HTTP call. I can save, uh, how do I want to call it? I'm going to call it, um actually now it's uh we know it's a get call we'll do a um, v edge device status i'm gonna save it over here and fabric devices i'm gonna save it and there we go i have my v edge device status call saved right headers i also need to create that X, XSRF token. And I'll do access token. And save it again. Right, so I specified the headers. I added that token. I have this in my endpoint. It's a get call. And I can easily do a send. So now I was telling you about the cookies. If I invalidate this cookie, right, it's removed. I removed it and I try to do a send call. I will get a still 200 OK, but I see here it's HTML. So if you see HTML output at any point, you're requesting JSON data and you're seeing HTML uh, in the response with the manager in SD-WAN, you know that the authentication, something's wrong, uh, the call did not work, even if you got a 200 okay. 
So we see here username and password our user account is logged, password is expired. So it's basically not working. If I go back to site health, I try to do this call again. Same thing, I got HTML now. Fabric devices, try to do it, right? I'm not authenticated. I don't have any session ID, any cookies. So then I need to go back to authenticate. And once I authenticate, uh, oh, so we have actually a problem here now. Cisco vManage invalid user and password. Um, so there could be an uh, a problem with this always on sandbox. No problem. Let's give it a try with our always on or oh, with our reservable sandbox, right? So if I want to point it to a different vManage server, I would simply go and edit this information. So the IP address for my reservable uh, manager server is 10, 10, 20, 90. I have an admin user in there. The password is Cisco one, two, three, four, five. And the port is 443, that's fine. Uh, all right, so that's changed to a new vManage server. So if I go just checking 10, 10, 20, 90, username and password is changed. So let's see if I can get, oh, there we go. So see how simple it is to point to a different vManage instance. And now I can go and get a token again, get a token. There we go, 84457. And if I check here, 84457 has automatically been updated for me. So now I can go and get a list of my fabric devices but from a different manager instance, right? So I see the devices, where's the data? Here we go. So we start with vManage is reachable, right? That's the IP address. So it's as easy as that as pointing it to a different environment, right? You change the uh, vManage user and password and you can perform all these calls towards a different manager instance. If I see your device status, vManage status is normal, vSmart normal, VH Cloud normal, right? So they're all in a normal state. Uh, any other questions? Let's see, let me have a check here. All right, so then I showed you Postman, we showed you collections, how to make a fork, right? Search uh, for Postman, Cisco workspaces. It's going to show you a list of all the collections. You can fork whichever one you want to work with. I forked here. I made a fork. I made a copy basically of the Cisco SD-WAN one and also the environment, right? So it's, you see a history of all the calls also with Postman. Um, you can create your own collections. You've seen here, we've added one more call to my collection that I've saved. Uh, you can modify this. You can add post calls also. Um, William Machado here would be, you know, where you add that show IP route endpoint. You will go look for it and you would add it here. And then you can at any point just go and click on, you know, authentication, get a token, uh, perform your call and it takes you, you know, a couple of seconds and, and you're ready instead of having to log into the manager GUI, right? Going through all the steps of configuration. Okay, where is it? Uh, click next and all of that. You have your API endpoint defined here. You can go very quickly, perform the calls and get the information you need uh, within seconds. All right, so 
since we have time here, um, I showed you Postman, collection, environments, variables. We've actually created dynamic variable, a uh, dynamic variable here that we saved so that that token that we're getting, and then we're passing it as a header for all the other calls, right? So we, we pass this as a header, the access token called x-xsrf-token, like I was telling you. So now another nice feature with, with Postman is that it can generate code for you, right? So let's see where is the code option right here. So for each individual call that you create, Postman can generate curl, well, uh, curl in this case. And if you click on this drop down box here, you can see a list of different programming languages that Postman supports out of the box. All right, so we could have Python requests, for example. So this would be the exact Python code, well, except the verify false here. <laughs> uh, but the Python code, right, to perform this API call, but in Python. So let's give it a try. Let me open Visual Studio Code. We'll open the um, window. And I'll just run that Python code. Let me open folder. Just have it in temp. And then I'll create in here. Uh, I'll create a new file. Uh, let me see where should I create it. New file, we'll call it SDN authentication.py. Right, so I'm gonna get the code from here. I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna go to my IDE, paste it. All right, so I have my URL, the payload, that admin Cisco1234. Um, cookie, I don't, should I need the cookie? And then I'm using the request library and the request library is popular Python library for performing and interact, performing uh, HTTP requests. So it's very handy working with uh, REST APIs. I was telling also on Tuesday. So we're just gonna do a, a verify false here. A verify false is basically that toggle that I was showing you in Postman, not to check the authenticity of the SSL certificate that's on this vManager instance, on this manager instance, uh, because it's a self sent certificate. We know it's not an actual valid certificate. Okay, so let me save that and then quickly sort my virtual environment. I write it in there. I should have requests already installed. Let me make it larger so folks can see. So I'm doing here then a Python as the when authentication. And then prince response.txt. I'm not getting anything, but actually let's make it interactive. And then print this response. Response 200, okay. So we know we have the status response that text doesn't have anything. Response, um, 
if we have a cookie. There's no attribute. Okay, so let's do quickly. Dear of response. So we see what options we have with response content cookies. Okay, so it's cookies actually. There we go. So we have that J session ID, right? Try here the value. Response.cookies would return to you that J session ID cookie. So that's the same exact one that we have here. Well, for 10, 10, 20, 90. Um, is well, it's a different value, but you got the point. Is that J session ID, right? So I want here not text but cookies to print. So if I run my script again now, it's gonna print out the request cookie, right? I have. So then you can start building on top of this, right? Get the token. What is the Python code to get the token? Would be you passing the cookie that you've got from the previous uh, call, then you get a new URL. And then you would be able to get that token. And same thing as we go to Fabric Devices, we have the code for, it's very similar, right? It's just the URL is different. We get data service slash device. Uh, and for this call, there's just, the difference is in the what endpoint you're getting the information from. Okay, Tamash. What would I write instead of false for the verify if I have a certificate and one SSL? True. Tamash, great question. You would write true. So if I go back to my code, right, and I I want to verify the authenticity of my certificate. And if I run it, my script now like that, failed, right? The script didn't run because I have SSL error, SSL certificate verification, certificate verify failed, certificate itself signed certificate. So I'm not even able to perform the call. I'm not able to run the code because automatically detected, hey, your certificate is not valid, connection closed right away, right? So great question. Uh, and that's, like I said, if you have production, you definitely, production environments, you definitely want to check the validity of the certificates you should have. And with SD-WAN, they're pretty good. You do have to have valid certificates on your manager, on, uh, on your validator controllers, on all your edge devices. You do need to have your valid certificates and you should always check for their validity right when you start building code uh, both in python and in postman and everywhere else where you build make sure that you have security at the for uh, at the forefront first and foremost make sure that you connected to the right device it's with the correct certificate and that certificate is valid um all right Great questions. Any other questions before we wrap up today's session? I know it's a, it takes a, it's a bit of a delay from what I, uh, I'm asking this. So I'll give you know a, a minute or two for folks to bring in the last questions. Just a quick recap then. We've had a look at the documentation. Uh, we started first of all with the dev center that we have, developer.cisco.com slash SDWAN. This is where we have consolidated links to learning labs, to documentation, to sandboxes, the video course that I've recorded a while back. Uh, so this also points you to sample code for code exchange. And we have 92 repos over there with different SAS trees in there, the SDK that I was mentioning. 
uh, right? Postman collections, links here to the Postman collections and environments. And then we've had a look at the documentation, right? So we've had a look at documentation for this, all the API endpoints for different versions. We keep a historical track of um, here. You see the change log, what happened, what changed from one version to the next. And we keep a historic view of older versions too for uh, API reference for your reference so that you know uh, if you develop on a specific uh, version, then you will be able to access that uh, API reference information for that specific version. There's a quick start authentication. It explains here how it's done, that J session ID that I was telling you about. There's also the XSRF token right, that we're talking about. Uh, there's the code snippet in Python. Then you need both the cookie, the J session, and then the token post 19.2. Uh, we've had a look at the developer resources, community support. Then I showed you uh, the API docs, right? Uh, where you have the chance of executing, trying, trying out each of these calls on that specific vManage instance. So you have your manager slash API docs would give you a list of all the API endpoints available with that manager uh, server. They're organized uh, in different buckets here. So uh, you're more than welcome to go explore them. And especially if, you're the, if they're just get calls, you know, you can try them out. Uh, if you want to perform a change and it's a post, be mindful that that will actually go and configure your manager instance once you press on that, you know, execute button. Then we'd have, we've had a look at developer tools, right? I showed you how to use developer tools in Chrome. Where are we connected to here, right? So we've had a look at developer tools right here on the right-hand side. You see the calls going on in the background. So you can, as you click, and you do your workflow in the GUI, you can observe what's happening, what API endpoints are getting triggered in the backend. You can save them, right? And automate that those steps, those workflows that you're going through the GUI. And then I showed you Postman. We've had a look at the uh, workspaces that Cisco has on Postman. Uh, I've cloned the Cisco SD1 one. I have created this from scratch. So if you want this call, right, to get that uh, token, uh, you can get it from here. I'll also update the um, collection on postman.com so that folks can uh, take advantage of this. This is, you've seen it first here during our workshop. This is actually not part of the get token, is not part of the collection that you uh, fork now from postman.com, but it will be, just wanted to show folks live, how we're doing it here, how we get that token and save it as an environment variable. Uh, we created one new call, right? The VH device status, it's a get call. And now if we actually send this, it should work because we're pointing it to a different manager, right? Using environments, it's very easy to point uh, all your collection and all the calls in your collection to a different instance of manager server with different credentials, possibly on a different port. And then this access token that gets dynamically populated as part of that simple two line JavaScript code. Um, Gloria, a general question, both about practicing with DevNet and other Cisco practices and hands-on when utilizing Cisco samples for practice, is there any specific scenario that we can take advantage of and use in our practices? Uh, is there any specific scenario? So, I mean, the scenario that we want to give you for the sandbox, especially the reservable ones, is we give you full admin access. So you see, I'm connected actually with an admin account here. So I can perform changes in that fabric, right? The always on is read only, but the reservable, you can create, configure, develop code is basically to give you an environment. If you don't have a lab environment, we want to be able to give it to you 
right? You can reserve it for up to eight hours, um, this specific sandbox, and use it for development purposes, right? You exactly what I showed you today. If you don't want to do it in a production environment, which definitely I would not recommend, do it in a sandbox, reserve it for eight hours, go check everything that I've showed you, right? And start looking at all the API calls and start developing your automation on top of that sandbox so that you don't need to use a production environment, right? To develop code. That's the main purpose. The main point of the sandboxes is to give you a full admin account on, you know, on a manager server that you can use for development purposes and testing purposes. So that's, that's why we want to, to give you access to the sandboxes. And like I said, you can use them, uh, they're free. And um, they're, they're there for you for mostly developer development purposes. Um, hands on, and yes, it's a giving you a hands on environment pretty much for free. We have lots of sandboxes, as the one is one of them. We have DNA Center, we have about 60 sandboxes now, right? Covering all types of different technologies. Uh, we have even ACI fabrics in there. So if you don't have your own ACI fabric, you can use the sandbox. Uh, all right, so keep in mind this week. Right, the um, the webinar we had on Tuesday and the workshop we had today on Thursday, they are part of the uh, SD WAN Automation Awareness Month. So we will have sessions, the workshop on Thursday, and also the following week. All of June will be SD WAN Automation Awareness Month. So please, if you haven't registered for the other sessions, please do so. My colleagues will go and will show you day zero, day one, day two uh, automation workflows. Well, they'll talk about Sestry. I just briefly mentioned it. The last week of June, they'll go over and cover Sestry and how to use the SDK for automation purposes, right? So if you haven't done so, like I said, please go ahead and register. I hope you found this session useful. Uh, like I said, it's recorded. If you have any questions, drop us a message in the on the YouTube channel. I'm following the comments over there, and I'll reply if you have any questions uh, pertaining to what we've discussed today. Um, any other comments? Let me quickly see if there's anything else. Uh, no, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you all for joining. I hope you found uh, the session useful. Uh, I wanted to do it all hands-on, right? So we had the PowerPoints on Tuesday, Thursday, all hands-on, bring your questions, follow along if you want with what I'm doing. And I'm happy to see that uh, you, you folks have been involved here with all your questions. And if there isn't anything else, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. And um, see you on the next one. Take care, everyone. And thanks again for joining. And make sure you join all the other sessions. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.